So um, we'll, I'll try to end uh, not, well, I'll try to end with a bang, I fear, with a whimper. We'll see what happens. So I want to talk about moral intuition and moral disagreement. I want, because I'm interested in vindicating some form of moral intuitionism as the right kind of moral epistemology for the stark raving. If you think Tristram's moral realism is stark raving, you should try mine. It's really <laughs> doubly stark and doubly raving. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do in the talk, here's the plan. I don't have the PowerPoint, but it's um, the plan is I'll tell you what I think an intuition is. And here I'm borrowing very largely from a former colleague of mine from Wisconsin, John Benson, and his conception of intuition. Um, I'll very briefly just say how I think intuitions justify beliefs. I won't try to defend that, a positive story there, but then rather devote the bulk of my time to trying to fend off two kinds of skeptical challenges to the role that intuition can play in a moral epistemology. And the first challenge is that the, and they're both disagreement related, the first is that the breadth of moral disagreement undermines intuition's ability to serve as a source uh, of epistemic justification, as a basic source of epistemic justification, because intuition, uh, sorry, disagreement, moral disagreement, reveals intuition to be an unreliable source of moral belief. And so it's disqualified from serving as a basic source of epistemic justification. And the second kind of skeptical worry I'm going to focus on is that certain facts about moral disagreement allegedly undermine any plausible intuitionist theory of doxastic justification because in the face of persistent moral disagreement, the final non-presumptive doxastic justification of all intuition-based moral beliefs has to be, in fact, inferential. Um, and that's a problem for the intuitionist who wants to cite uh, our moral intuitions as a basic source of justification that confers in many cases, all, not all, of course, but many, all things considered justification on the beliefs that the intuition prompts. Okay, so I'm going to try to diagnose the appeal of those two challenges and then try to uh, diffuse them. So first of all, let's talk about what an intuition is. Maybe just start very briefly by saying what it's not, because it's um, there's a lot of... Uh, there are a lot of different ways folks use the term intuition. It's not a belief or a judgment or any other doxastic state. It's a sub-doxastic state. It's not a tendency or disposition to endorse a proposition. It's not a guess. It's not a hunch. It's not a supposition. As I'm using the term, in, intuition is not a faculty of any sort. Neither is it infallible. Neither is it epistemically, the sort of state that's epistemically <coughs> justified or unjustified. Okay. So, that's all the stuff it's not. What is it? It's, as I say here, and here we go, the handout begins. It's a conscious experiential state that has content. It's got propositional content that's furthermore representational, and furthermore, it's presentational. And if this distinction is new, or, well, if it's new to you, uh, the, the thought is this, that we all have a belief that there are other people in Montreal right now, but no one right now is presented with that content. There's other people outside this room. No one is currently presented with that content. In, in intuition, one is presented with a content um, in a way that is in some ways parallel to the way in which one is presented uh, with a content in a perceptual experience. Parallel. Okay. It's not exactly the same, but it's parallel. Okay, so it's uh, got it's got furthermore it's presentational phenomenology essentially, and intuitions can conflict with our beliefs and our theories. All right, so that's what I'm taking an intuition to be, and how do intuitions justify? The answer is they justify directly. They are, I think, a basic source of justification, um, in just the same way that a perceptual experience, well. In the same way that a perceptual experience justifies a perceptual belief, namely directly and non-inferentially, so too does an intuition justify, or a moral intuition in particular, justify a moral belief. I'm not saying that the psychological mechanisms and processes of perception are the same as the psychological mechanisms and processes of 
moral intuition formation, but I'm saying that the way in which these subdoxastic states confer justification on the belief that they prompt is the same, namely non-inferentially and directly. Okay. I'm not going to argue for that. So you can leave now if what you were hoping for is like, oh, I waited 72 hours and I'm not that's for this, for the story. You're not going to get that story. Okay. So let's talk directly now, let's move directly to disagreement. And the paper has two parts from now on, and one's much, uh, one's much shorter than the other. Here's the shorter part, and this is focused on this uh, question about whether intuition, and I'm going to use intuition and moral intuition interchangeably from now on, whether intuition status as a source of justification is threatened because of the extent and nature of intuitive disagreement. Okay, so what I want to do is focus on two different arguments that try to threaten the status of moral intuitions, the epistemic status of moral intuitions. So here's the first, it's on the handout. A, a premise A, a belief is doxastically justified only if the psychological process that generated it is reliable, but the psychological process that generates moral beliefs on the basis of moral intuitions is unreliable, and so moral beliefs that are based on moral intuitions aren't doxastically justified. So I want to point to a, pro a potential problem for the first premise, for premise A. It might be false. Um, I'm not sure, actually, whether it's false or not. It might be uh, because it might be that reliability, we can set reliability aside because the phenomenological presentation, the content of um, the phenomenology within uh, an intuition is what grounds the justification. And it might be that even if um, a particular process that takes you from intuition to belief is not itself reliable, it may be that the content is so compelling uh, that once you have that intuition, it's highly rational and justified to form a belief on that basis, even if that particular process is unreliable. I'm not, I'm not affirming that claim. I'm just saying, I like, I, I'm willing to think more about it. I'm willing to enter hypothesis mode about that claim. <laughs> okay. But uh, in any event, I think there's a problem for the second premise, and that is, here's how I understand the process that takes you from intuition to belief, and that is forming a belief on the basis of what seems compellingly and possibly enduringly true to an agent. And that process seems reliable not obviously unreliable. Now you might say, Russ, that's not the process I had in mind. Okay, well let's talk about that process. Uh, what process do you have in mind that takes you from intuition to belief? I think in general here, I don't want to try to knock down this argument, but just raise some doubts about it of the sort I've just done. And of course there's the generality problem in the background here. How do I identify what process it is that takes you from the intuition to the ensuing belief. Um, only after we've identified, you know, formed a way of, uh, in uh, sorry, formed a way of identifying that process in a principled manner, will we be able to tell whether or not, um, well, will we be able to vindicate uh, B there? So that's all I want to say about this particular argument. I want to turn my attention now to a different argument. It looks superficially similar, but, it's, but it is actually quite a bit different. This is the argument from D to F. Moral intuitions can serve as a source of justified moral beliefs only if the processes that generate moral intuitions, rather than moral beliefs, as in the previous argument, are reliable. But those processes are unreliable, and so moral intuitions can't serve as a source of justified moral beliefs. So whereas the first argument tried to challenge the process that takes you from intuitions to beliefs, the second argument is challenging the process by which intui the intuitions themselves are justified. And the argument is that there's a great deal of intuitive disagreement, and that shows that intuition forming processes are themselves reliable. Okay. One thing I want to say here, I'll, I'll talk, I'll give responses in terms of varying degrees of lameness 
the lamest response, I think, is the one I'll start with. And that is to say, well, there's not as much intuitive disagreement as you think there is. I actually don't think this is entirely lame. I actually think that the extent of intuitive disagreement is much smaller than people say. Now, it's much smaller than the extent of moral disagreement. I think a lot of people, for instance, when it comes to trolley problems, there's overwhelming agreement, intuitive agreement about various trolley scenarios. There's far less agreement about the correct diagnosis and whether we ought to rely on our intuitions in those cases. But when it comes to the intuitions themselves, I think there is um, a lot more uniformity, let's put it that way, than is given credit for. But that, I don't think, is a fully satisfying um, answer to this argument. Another one is that there may be, and this I think is actually a little more, is, um, is likely, there may be many processes on the basis of which we form our intuitions. I'm not an expert in experimental philosophy. What little I know about it is, I, what little I think I know about it, is that uh, in moral psychology, there have been claims that there are distinct process, psychological processes that are responsible for the formation of our moral intuitions. So there are, for instance, different psychological processes that lead us to have so-called deontological intuitions as opposed to consequentialist intuitions. If, if that's the case, then I don't think we can say as a blanket matter that there are, um, of a given process that forms an intuition, that it's, I'm sorry, I was just going to say something false. And I, so I'm going to stop my sentence and start again. I may have said many things that are false already, I just didn't realize that. <laughs> so, but when I realized that, I want to stop myself. So I want to say in that case that it is that we need to take these criticisms piecemeal and once again identify the distinct kinds of processes that are at play here. It may not be, in fact I don't think it is the case, that there is just a single process by which we form our moral intuitions. Some of those processes may well be unreliable, and if you think that reliability is a precondition of a basic source of justification serving as such a source, then we'll want to say that intuitions formed on, those, on the basis of those processes should be discredited. But just because some are doesn't mean that all such processes are. The last thing I want to say about um, this argument before we move on to the bulk of the paper is this. I want to put uh, things in the form of a dilemma. So either the processes that generate intuitions in question, either they'll be individuated so that those who are morally virtuous or morally wise have different processes that cause their intuitions from the morally vicious, or those processes will be the same. Okay. So if the processes are different, if the morally wise develop their intuitions on the basis of processes A, B, and C, and the morally vicious do it on the basis of processes D and F, for instance. If that's the case, then premise E is false. That is, it's not the case uniformly, at least, that intuition forming uh, processes are unreliable. We have many instances of those that are reliable, namely those that are instantiated in the virtuous and the wise. But suppose, in fact, that these processes are the same across the board. In that case, I think that puts great pressure on premise D. Uh, it may be that the morally wise reliably form true beliefs on the basis of their intuitions, and that they do so non-accidentally, despite exemplifying somehow the same intuition-forming processes that the vicious do. Okay. All right, so that's all I want to say. I'm not even going to talk about demon worlds and how they might cast doubt on the major premises of these arguments. Just leave that aside and then talk instead, uh, or move instead to the last part of the paper, which is the biggest part of the paper. Uh, this discussion takes three parts. Okay. And the big question is this, does disagreement undermine the justification conferred by intuition? So right now what I'm going to do is move in a way that most people in the literature, sorry, make an assumption that most folks in the literature uh, grant, which is that our intuitions confer defeasible justification on our moral beliefs. Most folks in the literature don't go over the material I've just done. I just want to develop that because 
when I started thinking about it, I thought, well, here's an additional set of worries that most people don't canvas. I hope I've got some, something to say about that. But instead, let's just assume that intuitions do confer the feasible justification on beliefs. But then the worry is, but that justification is defeated by the presence of persistent disagreement, moral disagreement. Okay. So I want to take things in three parts. First, I'm going to provide a line of reasoning that supports the view that uh, peer disagreement, per se, doesn't by itself defeat any justification conferred on a moral belief by a moral intuition. That's going to be the first part. The second part, then, is going to be the provision of an analogical argument that's meant to be construed as a companion's and innocence argument for why the justification of intuition-based moral beliefs can withstand disagreement. And then lastly, I'm going to construct what I take to be the hardest argument against my point of view and try to offer some, I will offer some replies, whether it's successful is another matter. So let's take the first, the first part. And suppose, here's, this is right here on the handout now, suppose I enter into a conversation about a moral topic with someone, cunningly labeled S, whom I regard as my epistemic peer, and S the, then voices his opinion. And there's a conflict with mine, so now we've got two options. One is, uh, at least two options, just I'm going to focus on these two. I find S's view as likely as mine to be true, and, or I don't. Okay, so suppose I do. Um, and let's think, you know, this is like a, um, a bill splitting case, like one of Christensen's cases. Okay, in that case, um, if I thought that my interlocutor's opinion is just as likely to be right on the matter as mine, I think I should suspend judgment in that case. Okay. And I say something, is Annalisa still here? Or is she left? Oh, okay. So where's Annalisa when you need her? She on the here. plane. On the plane. Oh, okay, all right. Yes, well, so I say something that more than I needed to say, but I just want to hear what people thought about this. Not necessarily in Q&A, uh, but this is just a, a kind of toss-aside uh, comment, and that is depending on how we define what it is to believe something, it may be impossible to continue to believe that P, if you believe that someone else, someone else's view, not P, is just as likely to be true as your own. Now, I'm not, I'm not an expert actually in anything. But I'm definitely not an expert in what you know in the nature of belief. But it just struck me when I was thinking about this. Maybe I maybe it's not a belief any longer if I think that um, what it is that I believe is just as likely to be false as true. Okay. So I think that conciliation is called for in those sorts of cases where after the disagreement with someone you regard as a peer, you think she's just as likely to be right as you are. But what about, other, what about other cases where that's not so, and you're, in temp, you're inclined to stand your ground rather than to conciliate? What I think is that uh, you often are, in fact, you're usually justified in doing that. Or at least you're not, uh, you're not forced to, you're not uh, epistemically forced to abandon your belief or to conciliate just by virtue of the fact that someone else you've taken to be a peer disagrees with you. And I think the easiest case, uh, the most compelling case to support my view there is where after the disagreement, you think, no, this person is clearly wrong. And as a result, just of the content of his or her utterance, you demote that person. So, I respected you before we had this conversation. I thought that you were really smart and open-minded. And now you say something like this. Boom. I, no, no, I shouldn't have done that. It's not boom. I wouldn't kick somebody. So, no, boom. Nor, the normative boom. I'm lowering the normative boom. You are no longer my peer. Does that, does that sound, if that sounds arrogant, let me invite you to consider a case in which you're having a conversation with someone you don't know that well, but you just met this person, uh, and but this person has, strikes you as really uh, smart and reasonable and rational, and then he drops this totally misogynistic comment into the conversation. And then on that basis, you are authorized, if we're having a conversation then about something to do with the status of women in society, for instance, on that basis alone, that is just on the basis of the content and the apparent sincerity of the utterance, uh, 
uh, you are, on that basis alone, allowed to demote him from peer status. Okay, so why would that be? That's, I think that's kind of an interesting fact, uh, that uh, just on the basis of the content and the parent sincerity, you're allowed to do that. Okay, so I think the explanation for uh, why your credence is immunized in that case is not that your peer's belief is false, although it is in this given case. Because I think that would make it too easy to remove all skeptical worries that arise from instances of peer disagreement. I think instead it's because your interlocutor, your, the person <coughs> who previously took to be your peer, but no longer do, because that person's view is unreasonable and implausible. But then the question is, um, on what basis are you judging this person's uh, belief to be unreasonable or implausible? And what I want to say is, again, I want to offer two options. One is, beliefs are either intrinsically implausible or they're not. If they are, then when, you're, when you encounter someone with an intrinsically implausible belief, demote that person, if you had that person elevated to peer status initially. If, on the other hand, there's no such thing as an intrinsically unreasonable or implausible belief, then the question is um, how to justify, or what is the source of the implausibility or unreasonableness? And my claim is, my thought is that the source is the other elements of your evidential base. So the relevant evidential base isn't that of one, isn't that of your interlocutor, since from his misogynistic point of view, his ancillary beliefs may well support his claims. Rather, the unreasonableness and implausibility is to be judged on the basis of your own uh, belief network. So justifiably assessing the matter from your own perspective, that person's belief is unreasonable and implausible. And the lesson that I draw from this, and this is here on the handout, is this. How epistemically threatening an interlocutor's disagreement is depends on your justified assessment of the threat. An interlocutor's disagreement doesn't by itself constitute evidence that your belief is mistaken if you justifiably judge his or her views to be, from your own perspective, unreasonable and implausible. Okay. So, now to the analogical argument. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So, suppose you uh, form a true belief that P, based on your veridity, okay, what's, I'm jumping in a little too quickly. What I want to do is draw an analogy between the way in which our memories justify our memorial beliefs to the way in which our moral intuitions justify our moral beliefs. So, suppose, first of all, let's take uh, the, the memorial belief. Suppose you form the true belief that P, based on your veridical memory, that P, you then become aware that many folks you regarded as peers deny what you believe. But you remain confident. You really remember being there, even though other folks don't remember you being there, for instance. Okay. So I'm going to take these uh, two things as data points. First, your belief that P remains justified despite this disagreement. And second, your memory that P is the source of justification. Okay. I'm not going to argue for that. And you might think, well, that's too bad for us because those two data points need arguing for. But I was hoping they didn't. <laughs> okay, I could be wrong about that. Anyway, I'm going to take them uh, each as a data. And here's the analogical claim, the same holds for intuition in cases of moral belief. So despite the fact that uh, you learn of disagreements, moral disagreements, it's not the case that of necessity, uh, once learning um, of such disagreements on the part of folks you took to be peers, you are required to conciliate in any way. Okay. You might, of course, be required to conciliate, but that's because, that's not by virtue of the disagreement itself. It's by virtue, and this I guess I should have said more, made, put down on the handout. It's by virtue of the fact that after the disagreement, you have come to reappraise the, uh, the, the truth of your beliefs. Or, you've not done, you've remained intransigent, nevertheless you ought to conciliate because in the course of the disagreement, evidence has been brought forward that should undermine, that's not the disagreement itself, but evidence brought forth on behalf of your disagreeing interlocutor's position that should cast your 
beliefs into doubts. In that case, conciliation is appropriate. But in that case, it's not the disagreement itself that is um, forcing the conciliation. It's the fact that new evidence has been introduced um, in order to support the, interloc the disagreeing interlocutor's position. OK. So on the assumption that, my, uh, that I can remain steadfast in my memorial belief and in my moral view, why isn't doxastic justification such a case dis defeated by disagreement? And my claim is that the best way to answer that question is by saying, I occupy a privileged epistemic position. Well, maybe that's not the right way to do it, but that's the way I'm thinking about it right now. And then the question arises naturally, what in what does my privileged position consist, or uh, what confers the privilege? that I've got, in, that allows me to remain steadfast in the face of this disagreement. And I can think of three answers to this question, and each, uh, I'm not sure which answer is right. But I'll give you all three, and my claim is that if any one of these three work to vindicate your steadfastness in the memorial case, they will work to do so in the moral case as well. So the first is that uh, you got the truth. So your memory is correct. It's not a false memory. Um, it's not an alleged memory. It's a, it's a real memory. You're grasping the truth. They're not. In that case, your intuition, though, could be true as well, and that of your interlocutor, false. So if, if just possessing the truth is enough to insulate you from having to conciliate, then that might that just as well applies in the moral case as in the memorial case. Alternatively, it might be that you've got better evidence uh, in the memorial case than do your disagreeing interlocutors. You've got evidence that your interlocutors lack. Okay, but what would that evidence be? I think the answer is it's just the memory. You've got, you've got your memory. They don't have your memory. Um, they've got other things. Their memories or their false memories. But if that's the case, you, have, you could have a moral intuition that your interlocutors lack as well. And that moral intuition counts as evidence of the sort that warrants your steadfastness. Alternatively, and this is the last option I'll consider, it's that you're, you've got a more reliable memory than do uh, the folks you're talking to right now. Your memory is especially reliable. But it might be, of course, that your moral intuition generators, your MIGs, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, might be especially reliable, uh, and more so than that of your interlocutor. So maybe there's another answer, another way to account for why it is that you occupy a privileged position vis-a-vis -vis your uh, disagreeing interlocutors here. But those are the three I could come up with, and I think they've got direct analogs in the case of moral intuition. So now I want to move to the last part of my talk. How much time do I have? Um, let me compute. You have a bit more than 10 minutes. Oh, perfect. I might even... <laughs> if I don't start talking, you'll be down to two minutes in 30 seconds. So I'm going to start talking. Okay. Uh, all right. So here we are. Uh, all right. So let me introduce this argument with just a little bit of background. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of awareness. And, you know, obviously this was on my mind when I asked that question of Yako earlier. Although I think th things might be relevantly different because I'm talking about epistemic justification through well and not knowledge. We can think about that together a little more. But in any event, what I want to talk about the, uh, the role of awareness in uh, thinking about the normative relevance of disagreement, epistemic relevance of disagreement. So suppose you justifiably believe some, some proposition, some moral proposition, and everyone you know of also believes that moral proposition, but Suppose that someone else, a stranger halfway around the world, comes to believe the contradictory of that proposition. You're not aware of this, though, nor are you at all culpable for failing to be aware of this disagreement. In that case, here's my verdict. Your justification remains intact. I'm not going to argue for that. That's a familiar refrain, isn't it? Yeah, OK. So that's my verdict. My analysis is that the mere disagreement 
the, sorry, the mere existence of disagreement by itself doesn't defeat an agent's justification for believing something. And the lesson I want to draw from that is that disagreement threatens to defeat a belief, the justification of belief, only if you're aware or should be aware that your belief is the subject of disagreement. And this, I think, explains why so much of the literature talks about disagreement among friends, for instance. So, um, that is because you're assumed to be talking with your friends and so aware of the fact that someone else is disagreeing. And I think this awareness is crucial to um, points that Michaela was raising in, in his talk, too, um, where we see uh, disagreement as drawing your attention to a salient possibility that you might be mistaken. If you're unaware, and, and, there, and it's not the case that you ought to have been aware of the disagreement, then there's no such invitation being offered, and you're not, there's nothing amiss with the justification of your belief. Okay. So, uh, the last point I want to make just by setup is this, that even if you become aware of disagreement, that can even potentially threaten or to serve as a, as a possible underminer of the justification of your belief only if you do or you should believe that your interlocutor is your epistemic peer or superior. If you're aware of someone who disagrees with you, but you regard that person as your epistemic inferior, and rightly so, there's nothing about the disagreement that should threaten to defeat your justification. That's my point. Okay. So with that as a background, let's take a look at this anti-intuitionist argument. And here, let me just, I'm oh, sorry. What I'm trying to do in this anti-intuitionist argument is I'm trying to develop the strongest argument that criticizes my view. So there are two ways that you can go and if, you, if you don't like what I'm saying here. One is to say, Russ, you, you failed to do that. There's actually a better argument that you're not considering. Okay, and in which case I'd love to hear about that. The other, of course, is that, yeah, this is the best argument around, but your analysis stinks. Uh, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't work in any way. So here's the argument. If you do or should believe that your moral belief is contested by an epistemic peer, then your moral belief is justified only if you've got an additional belief whose content implies that you occupy a better epistemic position on the matter than your presumed peer does. And H. If such an additional belief is required for the justification of a contested moral belief, then that contested moral belief is justified inferentially if it's justified at all. So if you do or should believe that your moral belief is contested by an epistemic peer, then that contested moral belief is justified inferentially, if it's justified at all. And either you do, and if you don't, you should believe that all your moral beliefs are contested by an epistemic peer, so all of your moral beliefs are inferentially justified, if they're justified at all. And you might think, that's terrific. I love that argument. That's not a skeptical argument. It's just an argument that intuitionists can't accept. <coughs> um, but I would, uh, because I'm an intuitionist, I don't, I don't uh, accept it. I don't want to accept it. So, um, what to do about this? So, here's why you might find these, I think, here's why you might find these premises attractive. Um, first of all, with regard to G, the first one, if you do or should believe that you're engaged, engaged with a disagreement and disagreement with an epistemic peer, this seems to be an undercutting, it seemed to many to be an undercutting defeater of your original belief. The justification might be able to be restored, but not by intransigence. You need to introduce some further consideration to do the needed restoration, and that's got to take the form of a consideration that implies that you occupy a better epistemic position than does your interlocutor. And again, Christensen-type examples of, of bill splitting seem to vindicate that claim. And the rationale I've just given for that premise. Um, H just seems obviously true on reflection, and J strike, uh, seems to be plausible, either because you've got a healthy dose of epistemic humility, or because of moral error theorists who are damnably <laughs> smart. Yeah, so, uh, so for either of those reasons, and possibly other reasons, you ought to think that J is true. And those are the only three premises of the argument. So. Um, in order to do the needed diagnosis, or to offer my diagnosis of the argument, I need to introduce a couple of conceptions of epistemic peers, and these should be familiar to you from a number of presentations over the weekend. I've got my own lingo, my own monikers for these. It doesn't really matter what we call them. I'm just going to call it 
the generic conception and the equal reliability conception. I don't talk about the modal conception because I hadn't thought about it until uh, I heard Bianco's talk. Um, so that, that seems to me to be a, a novel entry into the, the literature that I have to think more about. But these two conceptions are well entrenched in a literature that, if you can speak of what being well entrenched in a literature that's basically 11 years old. Uh, and that's the generic conception says this, uh, you're a generic peer just in case by virtue of uh, being roughly equal to us with respect to general knowledge, cognitive abilities. You've got evidence either that's the very same evidence or as some folks have mentioned, it's very hard to actually have actual cases where there is exactly the same evidence. So if it's not the same evidence, it's at least as good as our own. And uh, these folks are motivated just as we are just as much as we are to discern the truth. That's what I'll call the generic conception. And then there's what I'll call the equal reliability conception of epistemic peers, and that uh, designates those who are as likely as we are to arrive at the truth on a given question. Okay, so I've got uh, three diagnoses of this argument, and that is that if you like the generic conception, then the first premise is false. If you instead prefer the equal reliability conception, then premise J is false and H is false in any event. So let me just go through these and then I'll wrap it up. So the first claim I make is that if you're operating with a generic conception of epistemic peerhood, then that initial premise is false. Okay, so disagreement with uh, the person you rightly take to be a generic peer doesn't require conciliation, I think. I don't think you need an additional belief to ensure the justification of your original belief. Um, and that's because there can be cases like the sort, like that of the misogynist I mentioned earlier, where prior to the disagreement, you take someone to be just as epistemically able and well-motivated as you are. But after the disagreement, you demote that person from peer status. Uh, my own, my own thought is that this generic conception is not really the one we ought to be operating with when thinking about, the, when trying to draw lessons from the nature of disagreement. Why is that? Because just imagine the person you take to be your generic peer, but on a given subject matter, you don't think that she's as likely as you are to get to the truth. In that case, I think a disagreement here does not put the kind of pressure that conciliationists have wanted to push uh, um, on those who are engaged in disagreement. So, in any event, I'm not a big fan of the generic conception and trying to draw lessons uh, from disagreement among generic peers. But in any event, if you are, I think in that case the right diagnosis, for the reason I've just given, is that premise G is mistaken. Suppose um, you like the equal reliability conception, which is what I favor, at least provisionally. I've, I've entered hypothesis mode. I've got to think about modal peers. But if instead you think that someone's as just as likely as you are to get the right answer, then I think that premise J is false. I think that there are a broad number of moral platitudes, kind of moral fixed points, about which um, there are many people, myself included, who think if anyone disagrees with that, I'm just going to give you an obvious, you know, a, an example that I hope is going to be totally uncontroversial. It's at least prima facie wrong to uh, kill people just for sport. Uh, if anyone were to disagree with that, then I'm not going to regard them as equally likely on moral <laughs> matters to get the right answer, as as I will. Not that I'm infallible or anything like that, but. They're not my peer. I actually think that when it comes to moral error theorists, whom personally I respect a great deal, I don't think that they are my equal reliability peers when it comes to moral matters. Now, of course, okay. If I haven't already convinced you of my arrogance, I'm just going to leave it there. Okay? Right. But put yourself in my position. Put yourself in, you know, ask it first personally. And ask yourself if you know if you encounter someone you regard as you you know I regard uh, most of the error theorists I know per I think I know most of them personally out there because there aren't that many of them but I probably don't um, but 
Yeah, I think that they are generically my epistemic peers, or most of them are my superiors. I think. But when it comes to moral matters, I actually don't think they're, I think they're misguided. Their meta-ethics has led them astray um, when it comes to moral matters. <laughs> I'm just reporting. That's all the biography. But it's the end of three. A little autobiography to pepper things. You know, to spice things up. The end of a conference. Okay. So, and I think that um, H is mistaken in any event. And the, uh, the reason I'm a little worried. I got a little worried a few minutes just before my talk about my di my analysis here. But um, the reason I think that H is false is is um, not. Uh, not original with me. It's taken from uh, a nice paper by Josh Thoreau and Nathan Ballantyne, uh, where they make this point that I'll make now, and that is that it's possible to defeat a defeater without. So sorry. Suppose I believe that P, and then there's a defeater introduced for P. It's possible to defeat that defeater without having to introduce any further inferential support for P. Okay. So, um, here's a very simple case. Suppose I believe that compassion is good, and then I uh, talk to you know, Jonas Olsen or uh, Richard Joyce, and they say, I don't know if they'd actually wag their finger, but they would say, <laughs> You know, in clip tones, uh, no, that's not good. Uh, then, suppose, okay, and you might say, well, that's a defeater for your belief, Russ, or at least you ought to conciliate a little bit, okay. And then suppose I'm tempted in that direction, but then suppose I find out that they actually don't believe what they say they believe. And that is, I learned that the putative disagreement was no disagreement at all. They're just having, you know, having me on and pulling my leg. And all that they wrote, they don't really believe. Okay. And that, okay, whatever. So in that case, I mean, maybe that maybe wasn't a good idea to introduce a, um, a normative example. But um, in any event, the general idea, I don't know if it's familiar, but I think the point is correct, namely that you can defeat a defeater without introducing any new evidence on behalf of your original belief. So when I learn, for instance, that my putatively disagreeing interlocutors don't disagree, that's no more, that's no evidence for the goodness of compassion. That's just a way of defeating the defeater. So this claim in H that if you're going to um, ha have to enlist another belief in order to support your original belief. Sorry. If you're going to have to um, enlist another belief, I'm sorry, yeah, an H, yeah. Uh, in order for the contested moral belief to be justified, then that contested moral belief has got to be justified inferentially is mistaken because it fails to take into account the possibility of defeater defeaters and the way that justification can be restored in a non-inferential non way. Rather than draw your attention to these two general worries about arguments from disagreement, which no one else has done, I'm totally surprised at. I'll just, I get, I got you, Christine. I got you. <laughs> Rather than talk about these two points, I'm going to leave them for your reading pleasure, and thank you very much. For your <laughs> um, I mean, two things. So, so in this talk, um, Russ defends. It just gave you credentials of, of moral intuitionism against two challenges, both motivated by moral disagreement. And both these versions of the challenge, I take it, are identical in structure. Um, there's like some kind of basic um, upshot of moral disagreement were to take it. Uh, the unreliability of intuitions in the first challenge, the provisional defeat of intuitive moral beliefs in the second, and then some the, the intuitionists will bring these upshots forth in order to make some kind of further claim um, to the effect that intuitions don't justify our uh, moral beliefs. So in each case, this leaves the intuitionist with two lines of response, either reject the putative upshot of moral disagreement or attack the further inference. And ambitiously, um, Russ Chifalanda develops all four lines of response in this talk. Um, and while I must say he has convinced me that in the end the skeptic's challenges fail, 
Um, I do have some preferences about which lines of response are ultimately most compelling, and my comments will be limited to a few remarks about Russ's two choice points here on each, on each challenge. So basically, I'll be talking about um, the argument from premises A, A to F, unfortunately skipping over the um, meet in the middle, and then ending up with a comment about the anti-intuitionist argument. OK, so regarding the reliability <laughs> challenge, um, so two, two possible lines of response. Either um, insists that moral intuitions are um, against the skeptic's claim reliable, or concede that point but urge that moral intuitions justify regardless of whether they're reliable. Um, and regarding this challenge, um, my suggestion is that we should be more cautious about divorcing um, justification from reliability in this context, and so favor the first reply. I think this is also um, broadly your preferred um, line of response, but I'm just kind of going to bring some more, um, some more, some more support um, for the, in favor of the first reply. So in defending the second reply, the, the one that um, will urge that moral tuition might justify regardless of whether they're reliable, um, Russ notes that reliability isn't a necessary condition on, on doxastic justification. Um, you know, he didn't mention it in the, in the, in the talk. Um, there are, after all, demon worlds, right? Um, but in the case of ethics, uh, we didn't go as far as demon worlds to find intuitions that misfire. Um, for surely, the morally vicious form beliefs on the basis of intuitions, too. Um, and if their intuition-forming process is the same as ours, it's a big if, but something we can still consider, um, then um, that kind of in that intuition forming process has to be unreliable. Um, and, and this is something I think is, is also plausible that um, some morally vicious agents form intuitions in good environmental conditions. Um, this unlike uh, cases of unjust uh, justified unreliable beliefs in the inner worlds. So this means that if intuitions justify on the basis of a one-size-fits-all process, they justify our beliefs despite being unreliable, even in good conditions. All right, so I think, I think Russ might envisage, um, if not quite endorse this line of response, but to me it seems a bit odd. So given that intuitions strongly dispose to belief, um, it would be surprising that intuitions alone justify our moral beliefs if they're unreliable in good conditions. And I think an analogy brings this out clearly. So if the contents of our perceptual seemings were not, even in good conditions, reliable indicators of the way things stand out there, um, we would no longer consider that perceptual seemings alone justify our perceptual beliefs. Rather, we would turn to the further processes that compensate, whatever those would be, for the unreliability of perceptual seemings, and consider these to be the source of justification for well-formed perceptual beliefs. Likewise, if the morally wise and the morally vicious formed opposed belief on the basis of the same intuition processes and the same environmental conditions, um, this would suggest to me that moral epistemology um, should be tasked with identifying the further processes <laughs> which account for the difference in the beliefs of the vicious and those of the wise. And we would then consider these further processes, not the intuitions, to be the source of justification for moral beliefs. So I think more needs to be said about this, and I'm sure Russ will address it, but it's a potential tension, I think, within the intuitionist project, and one which strikes me as a, as a good reason to favor more wholeheartedly the, the first reply to the reliability challenge. OK, so moving on to the uh, strongest argument, strongest anti-intuitionist argument. Um, I think there's a similar choice point that offers itself here, although it's not quite as transparent because the argument's more complex. So I'm just going to reorder some of the premises in the argument and single them out, hopefully um, doing justice to the argument all along. So as I think, the, ba the basic upshot of disagreement, which the anti-intuitionist wants to insist upon here, um, is given by two premises, J and G. So J is the basic premise that you do or should believe. I'm just going to cut to you should believe for uh, simplicity. You should believe that all of your moral beliefs are contested by an epistemic peer. And G gives you that conditional that if that's true, um, if you should believe that for any of your moral beliefs, um, your moral belief is contested by an epistemic peer, then that moral belief is justified only if you have an additional belief whose content implies that you occupy a better epistemic position on the matter than your presumed peer does. And together, these two premises, I take it, give us the basic um, anti-intuitionist upshot, if you want, of moral disagreement, which is that absent further second-order beliefs, 
implying that we are in a better epistemic position, all our intuitive moral beliefs stand provisionally defeated by the breadth of the moral disagreement, and so we'll need this kind of further justification which um, uh, won't be inferential, uh, sorry, will be inferential, sorry. And so to that kind of basic upshot, the anti-intuitionist is going to add, conclude, and this is on the basis of premise H, that therefore our moral beliefs can only be inferentially justified. So I'm, I'm fully on board with um, Russ's arguments that which he gives in, in the paper, um, which that to the effect that premise H is unsound, uh, is false, and so this further inference is unsound. Um, but Russ also thinks that the intuitionist can uh, reject the basic upshot um, of moral disagreement. And here I have some reservations having to do um, with the worry that Russ's objection to the basic upshot effectively relies on certain second order beliefs about our epistemic position. And in so doing, his objection seems to, um, I hate to use this expression, but smuggle in uh, the kind of belief it alleges we don't need. All right, so let me just uh, develop, unpack this a bit more carefully. So I'll be focusing on diagnosis two, but I think the same point can be made regarding diagnosis one. Um, so Russ tells us that J is plausible only on the backdrop of the a generic notion of a peer, right? Um, but if we adopt the equal reliability notion of a peer, he says we'll see that J is in fact false. Okay, but how do we know that? Um, because we believe certain moral fixed points, and surely no individual as reliable as we are believes otherwise. Um, but how in turn do we know that? Well, presumably because the moral fixed points are conceptual truths. We, being conceptually lucid, are thus certainly in a better epistemic position than presumed peer interlocutors who must be conceptually confused to disbelieve the moral fixed points and for that reason must be less reliable regarding the matter in question. In other words, J is false because there are certain beliefs regarding which we know we are in a better epistemic position um, than any presumed peer we could disagree with. Right. But that, it seems to me, doesn't show that intuitive moral beliefs stand justified without the support of further second-order beliefs about our epistemic position. Quite to the contrary, certain intuitive moral beliefs, namely belief in the moral fixed points, are immune to defeat by a disagreement um, precisely because reflecting on our epistemic position with respect to these beliefs allows us to undercut any such presumptive defeat. So it seems that the anti-intuitionist basic point is allowed to stand we might need second-order beliefs in order to ensure the justification of our intuitive moral beliefs. Um, I don't think this establishes the intuitionist the basic point. Um, I think Jane may be false for other reasons, but it's still um, this result is still interesting. Um, okay, but to me, still the, the most significant point by, made by Russ is that even if J were true, um, the anti-intuitionist basic claim would deal no significant blow to moral intuitionism. Um, after all, even if we're forced by disagreement into ethical reflection, what justifies ultimately our believing in moral fixed points um, isn't the belief that those propositions are conceptual truths and the further belief that we're conceptually lucid, but just that we intuit those propositions to be true. Um, and so one of the most valuable contributions of this talk, I find, is to make room for an epistemology of disagreement and a moral epistemology in general um, that can take seriously the epistemic threat of moral disagreement and yet coherently insist that intuitions alone justify our moral beliefs and justify them directly. 